Now, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to what well, I think is our 11th uh, NOA COVID webinar. Um, the program today will be concentrating on patients and pain, uh, which is one of the issues that we have at the moment, because we have a, quite a big uh, waiting list, as I'm sure uh, you'll hear about from Sweden and from other countries as well, and how we're going to cope with that moving forward. Uh, will be a problem. Uh, but meanwhile, we have patients on the waiting list and we we'll want to try and concentrate on those today. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, let me get my page down to work, sorry. Now, I have a little problem. Let me just see if I can get it moving. Yes, I have. Just to, to inform everybody, including our members, that the webinar is being recorded. It will be available to members after about 24 hours. All the participants, you will find you are on mute, but you will have the opportunity of using the usual raise hand questions during, uh, during the, the, uh, the various talks. And then we'll put that all together with a question and answer session right at the end. If you need to contact the coordinator, please, please use the chat function. Thank you. Um, so um, what's been happening recently? Well, in the UK, well, we're very proud of our vaccination success. I think it's 37 million and about 7 million having had the second dose. Uh, recent concerns about AstraZeneca. Um, so yesterday they, they, they've halted the trial on children with AstraZeneca because of some of the concerns about uh, pulmonary embolism, which has not really been sorted yet. So um, there's a little bit of a pause in that research. Um, there is a concern about what's happening in Europe, especially in France, and what might happen here in the summer months uh, um, when we all get to get back in the pubs and do silly things. Um, so last month in April, we talked about where we were up to and prioritization is happening for elective surgery, but we really um, are struggling with resumption of normal elective surgery, priority three and four patients. Um, remembering that the vast majority of our patients on waiting lists for joint replacements are priority three and four. And we found out that hospitals are at different levels. So down south, in the southeast, they're ahead of the game, where Midlands and the north are a little bit behind the curve. Um, we're in the Midlands, we're in Shropshire, and we're just about to really restart uh, in, within the next week. So hopefully we can play some catch up over the coming months. Um, the waiting list gets bigger and bigger, um, I'm afraid. Um, but, and this is a, um, this is a headline, not recently, this is about two or three months ago, so I'm not quite sure what the figures are, but they're pretty big. Um, we have some desperate patients and, you know, this is a headline. And the concern is that many of our patients at home are now on heavy duty medication. And we know that pain is something that after three months becomes chronic and much more difficult to deal with. Um, and uh, addiction to narcotics um, and pain medications is a problem. So we have may have more to deal with than just catching up um, on patients and putting in lots of hip and knee replacements. Now this is posted on the local website this morning and it's about access to doctors at the moment. And even though we're trying to get back to normality, there are patients who are really struggling to get help uh, locally from the GPs about various issues and we're well aware of the big reduction in the, um, in the incidence of patients attending for cancer, cancer problems. Um, but there's a lot of people just struggling to get prob help with, um, with some pain as well. So um, we can talk about that during this webinar. Um, we're very lucky we've got some excellent speakers today, starting with Sue Brown, who's the CEO of Arma, and she'll let you know what she does. And she's going to give us a little insight hopefully on, on what is happening with patients because uh, ARMA um, encompasses a lot of the patient support groups in the UK. 
Uh, Dermot is from UCLH and he is the lead for pain management and going to hopefully give us some tips and tricks. How to manage patients waiting for their first appointment with hip pain, but maybe also just waiting for their operation as well. And then finally, we've got the Joint Academy and it's a joint presentation by um, Christian and Professor Leif Dahlberg who are going to tell us a little bit about the Joint Academy, um, the philosophy behind it and how that may be useful to us in the UK. Um, my understanding is it's just been rolled out and it's at its er in its early days. And then finally at the end, I'll feel some questions and answers. So um, I'm going to go straight over to Sue Brown. So I'm gonna stop sharing now and I'll leave it up to you, Sue, to take it from there. Thank you very much for joining us. Brilliant, thank you very much and thank you for inviting me. So I'm Sue Brown and I'm the Chief Executive of the Arthritis and Musculoskeletal Alliance, ARMA. Um, we're an umbrella body and we bring together both patient organisations and professional bodies that work across the whole breadth of musculoskeletal health. Um, during the pandemic, uh, ARMA has been regularly bringing together all of our members in gathering intelligence from them about what has been happening on the ground and in particular what's been happening um, with patients. So most of our patient organisations run helplines and they've been able to monitor what issues are coming up on those helplines and get a feel for what's happening um, in the lives of patients with musculoskeletal conditions and a number of them have also done um, systematic surveys to identify what the issues are for patients and I'll reference some of those in a moment. Um, I don't suppose I need to tell anyone watching this webinar about the numbers of people who are waiting for surgery for much, much longer than they should be. And the difficulties that we're going to have in uh, getting back to anything approaching um, what we were before the pandemic. Some of the statistics are really shocking. Um, but it is also important when we're talking about this to remember that behind those statistics are people. Um, and people's experiences are also important. So I'm really pleased to be opening this webinar and just briefly introducing what things are like for the people who are waiting for surgery. So first of all, like everyone, those people have been home working with potentially quite unsuitable workspaces because they never intended to work, work from home regularly. Um, some people have been more active during the pandemic, but the majority of people have been less active. Um, everyone has been more isolated because of lockdowns and other restrictions, and quite a few of these people will also have been shielding, so they will be even more isolated. And all of those things will be having an impact on how they feel about their pain and about their um, health conditions. But the other thing that these people have experienced is the closure of other services. So a lot of community musculoskeletal appointments have been cancelled um, or only urgent and emergency appointments. And then things like gyms and swimming pools and yoga classes and all of the things that people might have been using to help to manage their pain and their condition have been closing down. And it's the combined impact of all of that that makes waiting for treatment and waiting for surgery so much harder. So what people have told us about what it was like during lockdown. Um, and one thing that comes across really clearly is about communication and the importance of communication. So um, the lack of communication from health services made people feel anxious. They felt abandoned and they often felt they had no one to talk to. And that led to increasing despondency, feelings of helplessness, anxiety and depression. Um, one of our members, Arthritis Action, did a survey um, about people with arthritis and how they were experiencing um, lockdown. And they found people were reporting increases in pain, increases in joint stiffness, um, that it was harder to complete everyday tasks, and also there was an impact on sleep. So all of those things are having a really big impact on people's quality of life. Um, another of our members versus arthritis did quite a substantial survey and they have, I don't think that one's been published yet, but they have helpfully uh, pulled out a few of the results that are specific to people waiting for joint replacement surgery. 
Um, so they found things like about half of those who've had surgery cancelled are reporting increases in pain and reductions in mobility. Um, two thirds of them say that they've got worsening mental health and about three quarters of them still don't have a new date for surgery. And there are also a small percentage of them that ha have had to give up work as a result of um, having to wait for their surgery. And they're, they're also reporting a real lack of communication. So going months without getting any communication about what's happening. Um, one person reported attempting to call the hospital to try and find out what was going on and simply getting a message saying, this mailbox is full. Um, most of them really appreciate that it is inevitable that there will be delays in their treatment because of a pandemic. But the thing that they really find difficult is not getting any information, not getting any communication and not understanding what's going on and how long they might have to wait. So that's just a, a brief picture of what is happening for people who are um, experiencing significant musculoskeletal and um, arthritis pain during the pandemic. But people have also been really clear about what they want. So here are some of the things that people say they want. The first one, given what I've said, will not surprise anyone. They want clear and honest communication. So if you don't know, when someone's appointment might be rescheduled for or how long they'll have to wait, say so. Don't say, I hope to operate within six months while thinking in the back of your head, mm, it's more likely to be about a year, I think. Be honest. People do understand that COVID is causing major problems, um, but they need to know where they stand and they need to know how long they might be waiting. The second thing is people who are going to wait far, far longer than they should need some support. They need some support with their physical health and they need support with their mental health. And we really need to look at ways that we can deliver that and we can actually support people through their weight. Um, the third thing that is really beneficial and as often gets forgotten, I think, by professionals is the value of peer support. So the two organisations that I've mentioned, Versus Arthritis and Arthritis Action, both provide support to people with osteoarthritis and people who might be waiting for surgery in different ways. It is worth making sure that people know that those two organisations exist um, and have helplines, have online support groups, have all kinds of things that, that will help people, as well as advice and information about exercise and keeping active. And then finally, people need to know they've been heard. They need to know that they've been listened to and that they're not forgotten. And they need to know that as individuals and also at a national level in terms of when we're talking about policy. They need to know that their pain is understood. They need to know that it is that people realise that it is not just cancer that is important. And everybody again on this webinar will know that waiting longer for surgery will reduce, um, the, reduce potentially reduce the out, beneficial outcomes um, and all the challenges that come alongside that. And then finally, they need to know and they need reassurance that we are doing everything that we can to get the waiting list down and to make sure that they can be seen as soon as is possible. So I think this is a, a really um, great webinar to be happening. And I hope that people on this webinar will be able to think about how they can deliver some of those things that uh, people are saying that they need. Thank you very much. That's great. Th thank you. So it, it's it summarizes everything. I think we are not very good at supporting patients on waiting lists at the moment. So when you have a three month waiting list and you put somebody on a waiting list, you can say, well, I'll see you in three months. People can get their head around that. But when, we're, when things are unpredictable, we have to have a plan in place to support patients on these waiting lists, which is my biggest concern at the moment. Supporting patients who we've, we've told more than a year ago you need a shoulder replacement or a hip replacement. Thanks for that, I appreciate it. Now we'll move on, if that's okay. Dermot, um, um, I'll let you kick off and introduce yourself, thank you. Thank you, Cormac, and um, thanks to the NOA for inviting me to speak today. And it's, a, it's an honor actually to follow Sue. Um, one of my roles is as chair of the Physiotherapy Pain Association and um, 
we've recently, I'm delighted to say, become a member of ARMA, so that's great. Um, but I'm also the lead physio at the Pain Management Centre at University College London Hospital, which is one of the largest pain centres in the UK, if not Europe. Um, when I was invited to, to give this talk, I, I kind of wondered where to start from, and I guess thinking about putting myself in the, in the shoes of somebody who's waiting for surgery, who has perhaps been told that they need surgery, and so it's really appropriate that I'm following from Sue and the kind of key messages that she's just delivered. Um, and while we're on a waiting list, we might notice thoughts coming up like, when, when am I going to have my surgery? What Sue has just talked about, you know, this not knowing or being told some vague timescale can be really quite challenging. Um, and this question, when am I going to have it? It won't go away. Along with what will happen to my body or my pain or to me whilst I'm waiting. That can be a really... Um, strong recurring thought that people are having while they're sitting on a waiting list not knowing what's happening and then this can lead into a whole range of emotions for example worry fear about the future distress anger they're not listening to me they're not giving me a date I've been told I need this so this kind of leads us into thinking a little bit about um, the cognitive behavioral model and I'll make no apologies for this but I have kind of a special interest in psychologically informed approaches for non- psychologists, so all other healthcare professionals, so all of us apart from psychologists, it can be really helpful to draw on kind of psychological approaches in our practice with people. And thinking about this situation where somebody may be waiting for surgery, we can draw on this hot cross, the hot cross bond that's often used to introduce contextualized cognitive behavioral approaches with people. So in this situation, waiting for uh, surgery, we may have a number of thoughts coming up as I've just shared, and that can lead into and influence a whole range of other aspects of our present moment experience. For example, the emotions that we have, like a shared distress, anxiety, worry, fear. And that can in turn can have a knock-on effect on the actual sensations we experience in our bodies. Our pain may get worse, our muscles may feel more tense. These things can lead to changes in what we do. We may avoid activities or things that we might feel might make our pain worse, for example. If we're not sure, we might not do something. And therefore we may end up just waiting, almost this horrible expression, rotting away whilst waiting for surgery can be where people feel they're at uh, in this limbo place uh, between being told they need surgery and having the surgery. Um, often when people come to see physiotherapists, they expect us to focus really on the bodily sensations and the actions, so actions being around exercise and activity. This is what they expect. And we kind of have to make them aware that actually we're also interested in what they're thinking and feeling and how these may affect their experience of pain and their ability uh, to manage the pain or what may help them to feel more in control of and more able to manage their pain. So it's really important to be aware of the thoughts and the emotions that accompany our our day to day experiences with pain, regardless of the reason for the pain. Um, and that kind of, I, I've drawn, there are many models I could have drawn on, but in the in the interest of time, I thought I'd pick up the Lyons uh, fear avoidance model as a really nice way of thinking about this. And this model was updated in 2016, but if we kind of think about the nociception that may be relevant to waiting for a, a joint arthroplasty, that, that leads to pain. And on the left here, we have a circuit where if we're not sure what to do, we may be worried, we may avoid things. We may not do activities, movements, or social engagements that would be helpful. And that can in turn feed into the pain increasing or worsening, our experience of the pain getting worse. We can end up trapped in this quite vicious cycle, unhelpful cycle of pain. Um, and this model speaks to a different route that we may be able to take out of that unhelpful cycle. If we can go to the right, thinking about what is important to us? How is this pain affecting our day-to-day -day lives? How is it getting in the way? And what could I do that may help me to keep aligned with or in the direction of what's important to me and my values? So um, it's really useful to, to be aware of this and to think about how this might uh, influence our practice and how we are when we talk to people who may be on waiting lists. So for example, if we use the example again of somebody who's waiting, thinking what's going to happen to my body, they may have been told, they may have been, when they were describing what was going on with their joint, they may have been told, well, it's bone on bone, for example. This is a common phrase that we often hear. They may be worried about it crumbling. If I move it, surely that bone on bone is going to crumble. Um, they may think that the more they move it, they're going to wear out. 
completely. And then they worry about the future, perhaps ending up more disabled or in a wheelchair. These are all very common experiences that people can have, um, which can be intensified when we're left, when we're on a waiting list. And I suppose I really wanted to pick up this point that language matters and that how, how we speak with people and how we explain things can really make a huge difference actually. And that maybe we can't change the reality that you know, COVID has impacted on services and waiting lists have gone up. It's true for all services, you know, pain included. But, um, but maybe we can look at some of the language we use that might help people to feel more confident about engaging in things that may help them whilst they're on a waiting list. So, for example, the idea of bone on bone, we could maybe replace that with these are normal age related changes. Um, if that's true, that may be a more helpful expression that might help them to reframe what's going on and think more, uh, open up more possibilities about activity. The idea of crumbling, we want to stress that if possible, it's stressing that it's safe to move. Um, it might be painful, but it's safe to move. Um, they may have to adjust how they move, but it's safe. This idea that motion can be lotion for our joints, for our muscles, for our bodies. Um, we may choose alternatives to you know, wearing out, thinking that maybe movement activity rehabilitation might help maintain what you have to slow down the uh, progress of the disease. Um, maybe it might even help improve some activities, but it certainly won't harm to try to keep moving. Um, and sometimes it's important to, you know, if we identify these core fears, these kind of deep fears of ending up in a wheelchair or fear of the future, maybe being able to address them where we can, you know, well, right now there's no evidence that you will end up in a wheelchair with this pain that you have or this condition. If it's possible to share some of these, that can be really helpful. So there are some key messages that we um, think can be useful to try and get across, whether it's in a, you know, a um, check in while someone's on a waiting list or at a first appointment. The first thing is that um, it's really helpful for the person to focus on activities that that matter to them, that they enjoy, that they want to do. If I had a pang, sadly, for every time someone comes to see me and has been tells me they were given a list of exercises, but they could make no sense of why these exercises related to their lives or what they want to do. Um, so it's really important to think about their values, what's important to them and kind of what activity and exercise might help them to move in that direction, to work towards that. We often hear people tell us they've been told not to do X, Y, or Z, or don't go running, or don't bend, or don't lift things, uh, don't turn. You know, often this advice, while well-intentioned, can actually really limit and restrict people's function and activity. And, and, and the reality is actually that in real life, we can't avoid these things all of the time. We will have to encounter them. And if we've been told not to do them, and then we encounter them in our real lives, they can be more threatening, more worrying, and can have more of an effect on our pain. So it can be really helpful when we're talking to someone to really focus on what they can do, what they can build up, how they can build up, rather than on what they can't do. And this kind of comes back to this idea that it's safe to move, which is a really important message. Um, you know, it might sound like uh, common sense, but reminding people to go low and go slow, start small, you know, identify their baseline. What can you manage at the moment? That's your starting point. You know, thinking about their bad days. How much can you manage on a bad day? That gives you an idea where your body is at right now, what you're physically capable of, and probably a good idea of where to start. You know, many people often try to do the amount that they think they can do on a good day and then invariably end up overdoing it. So we try and get them to think about maybe their, their worst days and try and set their activity levels at that amount in the beginning and gradually build it up, practicing little and often. We sometimes remind them that it's normal to experience increases in pain. Then this doesn't necessarily mean that they're making things worse or that their body is becoming more damaged. Flare-ups are a normal part of chronic pain and people will experience them even if they're not having any kind of worsening of a disease process. So it can be helpful to make people aware of that. You might experience an increase in pain. It doesn't mean you've made things worse, but it might mean that you need to adjust some aspect of what you were doing. You know, thinking about the variables that could be adjusted, it might be the amount of time they spend doing something or the distance or how far they move that part of the body. They can adjust these things. Reminding people that they, are, they can take more control over that. They can reduce or change or alter these to find what's going to work for them, to find their starting point so that they can gradually build on that. 
Um, and it's really important, Sue mentioned this also, this idea of peer support, finding a group, finding your tribe. We all, we're social animals. We do much better in groups generally, even if like myself, a bit introverted, we still do well in groups. So finding a support network is really, really, really important. And I'm gonna talk a bit about some resources in a moment, but um, one strategy that we sometimes use in pain management or physio more generally is pacing as a way of helping people to start where they are now and to build up their activity. And really pacing is a form of activity management. And there are different types. A, a, an operant learning approach on the left here is, might, might include things like graded exercise approaches. Now that's getting a lot of bad press at the moment in terms of chronic fatigue and long COVID fatigue symptoms. But um, uh, we would very much advocate for personalizing any kind of exercise approach to the person that we're working with rather than a fixed, you will do X amount each day regardless of how you feel. That, that often leads to issues for people. Energy conservation approaches might include rotating tasks. So if you've got three or four things to do in your day, why, in, in your day, why don't you break them up so that you can manage all of them? And that includes theories like, you know, energy levels of battery or spoon theory. These are often used to try and explain this kind of energy conservation approach to pacing. And then there can be symptom management approach, which is often a form of experiential avoidance or avoiding the pain altogether. And we know that that can often lead people into into dead ends and problems when they're trying to live with and manage the pain. Uh, it can also be helpful when people are on a waiting list to remind them of the benefits of prehab. You know, the fact that if, if this surgery is inevitable, then they can, if they can be moving and using as much as possible, that can help them to be as fit as possible for the surgery so that they can recover as quickly as possible after the surgery. So that, that may be an incentive that works for some people if they're struggling with other reasons to keep active. And I'm just going to end with a few um, different kind of support things that you may be able to signpost people to. This has recently come out, the Joint School, which is a collaboration between and many different uh, professional groups in the orthopedic community. And it includes an app which patients can download. The link is here, and I think it's going to be shared in the chat as well for you. Um, but it includes things like classes and uh, information sessions and things like that that patients can book onto to give them more information, knowledge and understanding. I'm also going to shamelessly plug the Physiotherapy Pain Association. We, uh, during COVID, have developed a range of uh, resources to support people who are living with all sorts of long-term pain conditions. And if we, if we um, can accept that about 80% of all long-term pain is musculoskeletal related, then these resources are relevant and useful. And finally, Sue talked about the value of peer support and Live Well um, Footsteps Festival is something I've been a part of as a, the collaborating group. It emerged because of COVID. It's a kind of a collective of people who live with long-term pain and clinicians who work with people who live with, um, who work with people with long-term pain. And it's all online events, including activity, movement, mindfulness, um, education sessions, uh, knitting, crafting, writing, journaling, all sorts of events that people can attend. They're free. Um, and it just helps people to, uh, to find their community, find a network of peer support that will hopefully help them uh, whilst they are um, trying to uh, manage their pain on a waiting list. So I'd like to thank you all for listening. Hopefully that's given you some ideas. Um, thank you. Thank you, Dermot. That was really, really excellent. Uh, great summary and great tips and tricks. And I do hope we have some Spain specialists and nurses and pre-op nurses that are there to listen to what you've said um, because the mind and body go go together and we do have an increasing problem with the mind at the moment and that really needs to be addressed along with the physical thing just one comment about ending up in a wheelchair unfortunately there are patients who are heading in that direction and um in the prioritization of these patients, we've found very clearly you cannot look at one x-ray and determine the patient's level of pain or, or deterioration. If you look at two x-rays, you get a little hint as to whether the condition will deteriorate because you can get to a stage in orthopedics where you lose bone. And if you lose bone in this waiting period, then you will have a less, you'll have more complicated surgery and less good outcomes. And that applies to just about every joint. So on that, I'm just going to move straight over
to Christian and Leap to talk about the Joint Academy. Thank you very much. Well, Mark, I will just quickly pick up the introduction of Kyle here uh, before passing over to uh, Leif and to Christian. Um, thank you very much for the introduction and the invite, and thank you, Sue and Dermot, for such excellent context. Um, the Joint Academy has digitised the first-line treatment of chronic joint pain through a journey that goes back over a decade in Sweden, and as such, we have a wealth of experience and evidence that um, I'm going to uh, leave Leif and Christian to share and really focus on today. I will provide a very brief um, overview of the Joint Academy solution, what it is and where it fits, uh, but without further ado, let me share my screen and pass over to Leif, if I could. Thank you so much. I'm so happy. I just shared the wrong one. The, yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> the possibility to speak today and to uh, continue this um, important uh, matter. And I hope to give you some um, context and, and a suggested solution to the last speaker's talk, which I uh, enjoyed a lot. So um, uh, I've been involved in looking into people with joint pain and joint disease for my career and both research-wise and, and clinically. Um, so we, we all know that um, next is that osteoarthritis is so very prevalent and, and that it costs billions of pounds. Um, what is maybe not as, as well known generally is that uh, some of the treatments are not used uh, in uh, are not very well evidence based uh, and that uh, some of the treatments uh, include uh, an overuse uh, which would be better helped if they were um, uh, in more evidence based way and that we have understand the picture of osteoarthritis from the beginning to um, the joint replacement next please what is more important as well is not uh, that it is prevalent today, but uh, that the incidence uh, is uh, growing, which means that it will be even more prevalent in the future, uh, which means that uh, many more patients will have osteoarthritis within 20 years, and uh, that uh, we have to do something um, with the structure. Uh, we have to rethink uh, uh, how we should manage these patients when the problem starts. Next, please. And um, maybe you, Kyle, can give some background to the UK situation. We have heard it uh, already, uh, but I, I think it could be repeated a little bit to give a context to the next part of the talk. Yes, yeah, certainly. Thank you, Leif. So I will just quickly provide um, you know, a sense of what it means and what from joint academy perspective we believe the opportunities when it comes to rethinking the treatment of osteoarthritis and the solution that joint academy have before really digging into some of the evidence that exists so both speakers have already alluded to and Cormac has alluded to himself the the growing challenge and you know the way that um, COVID has exacerbated this challenge and I think the key message we want to share today is that adding more resources is not the solution and rather there is a need to rethink the way that we treat osteoarthritis as a chronic condition and as one that is episodic in its nature so a linear uh, mode of treatment is not optimal um, and not the most effective way to go about treating patients with osteoarthritis and rather we need to find a better way to provide first-line treatment to patients regardless of the point at which they're diagnosed and it may well be that that's right at the beginning of the condition but as many of you will know patients have a tendency to uh, brush it under the carpet and, and ignore it for as long as they possibly can do and that means individuals will be presenting further through but regardless of that point of presentation first line treatment does offer significant benefits to both the patient and to the system and actually technology is vital in enabling this you know by being able to care for patients more efficiently and and more um, effectively we can encourage the kind of positive uh, behavior change and activity that is necessary to tackle 
pain and improved physical function. Those key determinants in quality of life and those key determinants in a patient's desire for surgery. And in effect, what we're trying to visualize here is an approach that says, look, if we can provide care for individuals and enable a regular cycle of interaction between patient and clinician, we can ensure that those who do proceed to surgery, are those that require surgery, those for whom alternative treatments have no longer worked and where first line treatment is working, where exercise and education is proving to be successful in managing that pain, then a patient should continue in that treatment. Or alternatively, many will feel enabled to self-manage that condition, be that for a year or five years. It, you know, it's a chronic condition that you know, may very well reappear, but we want to provide people with uh, that capability and that confidence to do so. Um, of course, there are hundreds of thousands of individuals already on waiting lists, and that's, you know, the purpose of the discussion today, and we cannot disregard that fact. But providing digital or providing any kind of first-line treatment, particularly providing digital first-line treatment to these individuals, does offer significant benefits to patients, even where they're on a waiting list awaiting surgery, and also to the organizations that have responsibility for caring for these individuals. So by enabling individuals to, you know, to embark upon a program of uh, structured, personalized and supported um, exercise, we can improve strength, we can improve physical function, and we can tackle you know, the pain that has such a negative impact on the quality of life. And of course, as a, you know, a provider of care, these individuals are in better physical conditions. So clinical outcomes are improved, complications are reduced, um, and we can tackle efficiency through patients, you know, you know, on the day cancellations where patients turn up and aren't in the physical condition that is required. Um, in effect, we, we propose a solution and an outline that helps organizations to identify those individuals in greatest need um, of surgery and prioritize those individuals as a way to most effectively tackle the growing backlog of patients. Um, the Joint Academy solution really quickly is a um, app-based solution that provides patients with access to a personalized physiotherapist, both through structured consultations and ad hoc message-based communication. Uh, personalized and tailored um, exercise program delivered in short bite-sized chunks um, and uh, nudged by both the technology and by the clinician on the other side to encourage adherence and, and uh, habits and positive behavior change. Um, educational materials and resources that tackle some of those misconceptions that have been discussed previously. You know, that, that knowledge and awareness piece that's so important to provide individuals with um, the confidence they need to manage the condition and to you know to effectively improve the condition um, and all that's wrapped up with you know um, behavior change type um, what's the word I'm looking for um, you know technology built around encouraging behavior change showing individuals how they're progressing regularly seeking um, individuals to provide physical function tests and pain scores that verify both to uh, the clinician and to the patient that progress is being made. Uh, Leif, I'm going to pass back over to you. Yeah, let me um, add to your uh, nice talk there that uh, the patients that we include, yeah, I just want to make this clear, has the same demographics, uh, pain, function, uh, impairment as patients actually having joint replacement. So we, we, this is not a treatment that only uh, is in use of patients that have less symptoms or less severe OA. They, in average, they are the same as a, a typical OA patient. Um, what is also important to um, understand with the app is that it is the, uh, the context actually that is uh, uh, unique. It, it is not our exercises. It is not our uh, uh, lectures and, and in, in, in uh, knowledge that we are giving our patients. It is how we deliver this, that we deliver our treatment uh, uh, day by day uh, with push notifications and that the patient take part in the app and the treatment uh, and the management and that there is a chat support uh, uh, so the patient can be seen whenever needed uh, uh, and uh, th that is one I think uh, a key thing behind this that is not only uh, uh, one direction uh, uh, way in this app it, it, it's always a communication. So uh, how was this um, developed um, in Sweden 
we realized uh, quite early that uh, there was uh, um, uh, some benefit in, in having patients uh, in some kind of a, uh, informative way, giving exercise, giving uh, lectures. We looked into the literature, exercise was good and so on. So we made a structured treatment uh, in a face-to-face -face way, what we used to call the osteoarthritis school in, in Sweden. We had a register, uh, still have a national quality register. Um, where we monitor patients having this structured treatment. However, uh, we realized that uh, we didn't reach uh, the large and huge number of patients with osteoarthritis. Uh, maybe 20% of those that see medical advice of osteoarthritis actually uh, had this uh, structured treatment. And, and we then decided that uh, uh, when technology uh, development uh, allowed it, we could do uh, this uh, digital. So we just made this digital, uh, the treatment that we had developed in Sweden. Um, and uh, of course, um, you have to do some, some major changes to how it is delivered face-to-face -face and how it's delivered digitally. And that is, I, I would say, the key message behind our solution that we uh, are um, activating patients and having patients taking part to self-management on a daily basis, but with very small steps. So uh, we say it takes some five to 10 minutes every day. And whenever needed, there is a physiotherapist uh, behind. Next, please. So uh, um, from our database, we have published more than 10 clinical studies, uh, peer-reviewed studies. The last one is actually done uh, by an unbiased uh, group in Nottingham that used our uh, uh, app uh, and uh, uh, the control group was uh, your traditional treatment, uh, the nice way uh, in, in UK. And it was a six week study. And we showed that, or they showed that uh, using the app uh, was far better than the traditional treatment. We, in Sweden, we have done costing analysis showing that this is very cost effective. We have also uh, shown long-term results uh, of the outcome in function and pain and more and qualitative studies uh, interviewing uh, the patients. Next, please. So the, these are the results from this long-term study where we monitor pain with a, a numeric rating scale. Uh, you can see that to the left, uh, it, this is over one year. And here we have a cross-sectional analysis. It's not an RCT in Sweden, where we check outcomes in our face-to-face -face treatment in red and when the same treatment is given uh, digitally. We also measure physical function. And that is the 30 second stand-up chair test. Uh, that is how many times you can raise up from a chair in 30 seconds. And we can see that the improvement is in both uh, ways, uh, uh, some 40%. Uh, percent. Next, please. Uh, we also have um, uh, a lot of different validated uh, questions in our health questionnaires, with, and we follow the patients regularly uh, monitoring these, so we know that the majority of the patient experience really clinically relevant improvement uh, that uh, when uh, we ask the patients if uh, they think that their symptoms are so severe that they wish to undergo surgery. Uh, and then we follow if they change their mind uh, during uh, our treatment. Uh, and we also monitor uh, uh, if they change their uh, medication uh, when they are in the treatment. We can also see that we have a, 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 all those patients deciding to go into other treatment. Um, we can see um, that they adhere. So, uh, so in average, we can say that three out of four patients are doing three out of four activities uh, uh, continuously in the treatment. And the activities are then exercises, lessons, and doing, uh, following our questionnaires and answering those. Um, okay, thank you. I think that was 
the last one. We're happy to take, or we are happy to take questions. That's excellent. Thank you very much. Um, I got the feeling that the Joint Academy is, is a little bit similar to uh, Joint School, which has been, we have discussed at a previous webinar. I'm not so sure if you're familiar with Joint School. Uh, you want to comment on the similarities between the two? So I think the key difference, Cormac, and again, please do correct me if, um, if uh, my understanding is, is wrong, but I think it's the inclusion of the clinician interaction. So uh, patients who are treated by Joint Academy um, have direct access to a physiotherapist as part of that program. So it's very much um, physiotherapist led care with the digital program alongside it rather than um, an undeniably valuable repository of resources exercises and so on and so forth now um, i confess to not having a complete understanding of joint school but that would be my interpretation uh, that would be similar to joint school have they access to a surgeon and an x-ray to say well what does the surgeon think i i, I get what the physio say but what does the surgeon think Christian, would you like to respond? No, no, they don't. Uh, so we started that way, actually. That um, <clears throat> Sorry, Christian and Cranston, I'm an orthopedic surgeon, and I work for also for Joint Academy as a medical advisor. But <clears throat> in the beginning, we had also orthopedic surgeons in the program uh, accessible to the patients, but there was not a great need for that. Uh, so uh, it's, uh, it's very important for the patient, I think, to have this support that they can talk to a clinician, not a uh, uh, always an uh, orthopedic surgeon. Uh, so the, the physiotherapist that works with the Joint Academy are well, very well um, um, trained by us in osteoarthritis treatment, the uh, latest evidence, and they also work cl uh, clinically with patients with osteoarthritis. So they are giving great support to the patients. So um, no, they, we don't have that and uh, we don't see the, the big need for it either. Okay, um, so we have, sorry. Yeah, I can just add, uh, as we saw in, in the slide there about the patient uh, traveling through uh, uh, the journey of osteoarthritis and the process that we are, are evaluating in progress uh, every, uh, at least every third month. And then uh, we refer the patient uh, to other uh, services and to physical uh, examinations, but we don't provide uh, specifically an orthopedic surgeon in the app, but we have uh, we, we collaborate with other uh, uh, um, healthcare providers that uh, are uh, giving uh, people uh, patient support when needed and checking them out. Okay. Yeah, I, th I think that it's it's important for the patient to have support, as previous speakers has, have said, uh, because patients with osteoarthritis they go through ups and downs. And they do want to discuss their problems, their anxiety with someone. But most patients have very simple questions that a physiotherapist can answer without any problem. So when the, our physiotherapists see that the patient is deteriorating for a longer time, they say that now you need to, to seek advice from your orthopedic surgeon. Uh, so um, uh, we help them when it's time. And this is also good because then it's, uh, we, we help the orthopedic surgeons time the surgery. Now we have the patient, we see uh, this patient is improve, uh, sorry, deteriorating fast. You need to go to surgery. Okay, thank you. Um, there's gonna be a lot of questions about the Joint Academy, but what I'm gonna do is just go to a question that's come up from, to Dermot. Um, and maybe, maybe the panel of Joint Academy may wish to comment. What about patients on waiting lists for joint replacement? What about a steroid injection? Dermot, would you like to comment on that? Nobody talked about steroid injections. In temporizing um, and helping patients with pain. I guess well, there's a few ways I could pick this up. One is... Um... Steroid injections, you, you're all aware, had some kind of questions around them in relation to COVID. And so um, there was questions over what steroids might do to COVID. So they were kind of stopped for a while. Um, and also um, most centers like ours were told to stop all non-urgent treatments of which steroid injections would be included. So it wasn't a possibility to offer. So uh, so that's, that's the first thing. Um, and I guess 
guess the other challenge we have more generally is like paying services and that and services that tend to offer these i think um by the time somebody gets to see us and our waiting times and that, they may have passed through a phase where a steroid injection may be helpful. Um, it's thinking about whether that's something that's uh, possible in uh, the community setting or in the primary care setting rather than in, in secondary care settings, if that, if that makes sense. So it's being, often when people want these, they want to access them quickly and sometimes pain centers or places like that where they may deliver, or rheumatology where they may get injections don't, have the ability to provide them quickly enough for them. So it's still thinking about what they can do at that time. Kind of a comment from Leaf on steroid injections. Um, yes, I, for instance, in look, maybe you might wish to distinguish between lower limb arthritis and upper limb arthritis. Uh, let me uh, um, start with saying that uh, I, I'm not very fond of uh, passive treatment at all. You know, we should activate our patients. And I think we heard that very well today that we should get our patients going. So um, giving promises uh, only uh, with medical treatment uh, injections and so on, I don't think that is very wise uh, uh, for our patients. But with that said, now and then, uh, I think uh, uh, an, an injection could be uh, of value, you know, it could put inflammation a little bit down, it could help patients start moving, you know, but it should not be given instead of an active treatment, uh, but with then an active treatment. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to go on to most of these questions will be uh, to the Joint Academy. Um, uh, Dermot and Sue, if you have any questions specifically now, do you have any questions to ask the other speakers? Because I've got seven here that I want to ask the Joint Academy. The, the only thing I would pick up is to agree that we, we, when we set up online services, our patients told us that they wanted something where they could have personal interaction with somebody. So what Kyla shared around that ability to speak to somebody, uh, people struggle when they're have, have been asked to self-direct through web resources. That's really difficult because often it heightens their awareness of their pain and discomfort. And that's a really difficult thing to ask anyone to do. So the value of having support, whether that's clinician support or peer support can't be um, overstated. Okay, thank you. So on to Joint Academy. The first one that's come up is about your elderly patient who's not tech savvy and they don't have a smartphone and um, they can't connect with the internet. And that's a lot of our patients in the UK. Um, the vast majority are still on their 1980 Nokia 3110 or whatever. So can you talk to me about those patients who cannot cope with the technology, please? Um, I can try. I can be a little bit provocative and say that uh, uh, obviously, I don't know exactly what's going on in the UK, and I, but I've heard the same arguments from Sweden, and they are not true in Sweden. Actually, our patients are in average uh, 65 years old. We have a lot of patients in their 80s and in their 90s, and they are doing as well as the younger patients when it comes to to outcome. Of course, I, I realize that not all patients have a, a smartphone today, but the number is, I would say, expansional. It's increasing uh, a lot. Uh, and um, what was true yesterday is not uh, really true uh, today. But um, then maybe just diamonds. Uh, suggesting we, we shouldn't uh, talk uh, about the don'ts we, we we should talk about the do so so i mean just because not everybody has a smartphone we should not give those that have one uh, um, uh, no treatment then uh, i hope you know that that more and more people uh, will will get engaged and will use um, a smartphone i don't know kyle if you have any any data from the uk about uh, smartphone use yesterday and today and Not tomorrow a, and right, I'm afraid I've been too um, okay good. thanks for that um it's not only about smartphone use it's about coverage there's places in the UK we can't use a mobile phone still so um it's okay. about coverage wi-fi coverage etc and the I'll quality of it. but, uh, it's something to think about I think so second question is around you did mention a Kyle I think said we can help you with prioritization now Yes. That's a big thing for us. Um, so how can you help us with prioritization? So I've got a bunch of patients on a waiting list. I don't know which one that goes first. So how, how, does, how do you help with prioritization? 
uh, in, in our experience, um, you know, um, the healthcare should be very efficient, which means that some of the patients are put on a waiting list after five minutes visit uh, uh, with an orthopedic surgeon, you know, and I don't think that is optimal. It may be right, but it could also be wrong. So the suggestion is that if you follow the, the, the the process that we suggested that uh, all patients should start testing um, um, first line treatment, uh, which is not dangerous. It's not dangerous to move, to do exercises. It will not make the operation worse. It will be better for the outcome. You learn your exercises that you should do after the operations and so on and so forth. Uh, meaning that that um, if, you, if the patient after some three months, which I think everyone, if, if, you, if you are you know, 65, 67 years old and you have pain for a while, maybe five years, you can uh, try three, three months more for a treatment that may help you and delay uh, uh, or make the outcome after the joint replacement much better. So, so by, by doing the first line treatment first, those that will not get help from it will, much, will be much more uh, uh, in a better position uh, and will probably be the patient that should be having the, the joint replacement. Uh, and, uh, can, I just, sorry, can I just add? We also, from the program, we get a lot of statistics. So you can also see how much the patient has improved in pain and function. And these can also be parameters that you can follow. Uh, that can give you a guideline when it's time for surgery. Can you then tell me about an x-ray? In your program, at what stage do patients have x-rays? And what is your criteria for perhaps advising a repeat x-ray? So can you talk about x -ray, that? Uh, can, I, can I say x-ray is a little bit obsolete when it comes to osteoarthritis if you are not going to have a joint replacement. It should not actually be in the triage, I think. It should, uh, but if, I mean, if you don't have any structural changes, uh, uh, you're very unlikely to be better with a joint replacement. That is true. But if you have struct structural changes, you still are, are um, in a good position to get much better uh, uh, with exercise. So an X-ray should be uh, used when we believe that the patient uh, uh, will need a joint replacement or when, the treat when there is a treatment failure or when the symptoms are not really conform with an osteoarthritis diagnosis when there is uncertainty, but it should not be a general uh, uh, examination in patients with uh, joint pain. That will only delay and make uh, outcome uh, worse, I would say. I mean, when patients can learn what Diamond said, you know, if they get the information, oh, it's bone to bone, it looks terrible, you know, how, how, what do you think that patient will feel and how would they uh, improve in having a, a first time treatment? And how would you then distinguish if they had a tumor or perhaps uh, some low grade infection in their knee without an x ray? How do you exclude the serious stuff? What are your red flags? Yeah, we have in, in our uh, inclusion of the patients, we have these red flags, uh, red flag questions. And, and just to put it short, I'm, I'm com completely confident that we make no more mistakes than uh, a clinician does in, in this matter. Uh, this means that if the symptoms are conform with osteoarthritis and the patient in the treatment outcome also is going in the right direction. Uh, you know, we're all happy, but we, we, we have the health questionnaires with red flags uh, related to your question. Then we have um, a, a chat or a talk uh, with the physiotherapist before uh, the diagnosis is set and the treatment can begin. So, so I, I believe we are quite careful and we are aware that this could happen but uh, uh, our experiment, experience show that um, most of the patients start the treatment. Uh, there are a couple of percent of patients that we say, you should not start our treatment before you have had a physical examination or before your general practitioner has given you uh, uh, a, a clear sign. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a few more questions popping up now. Graham Wilkes, this is a long one. Um, 
What is the expectation of changes in clinical outcomes, complications and length of stay in the cohort of patients who have waited so long? Doesn't it become essential to be proactive with this cohort? Otherwise we'll be heading into an even worse situation. Just operating down the line on the group that were assessed many, many months ago seems hazardous. It's more of a comment than a question that, are, are there, is there a question? I think there is, yeah. Sorry, the first line is a question. Um, you should I don't know if, if I understood it correctly, but I, I would say that the expectations of outcome of a patient that has been on the waiting list for one year, completely inactive, uh, would not be better with a joint replacement than having first line treatment. Uh, um, because those patients are really not in a good shape to have a joint replacement. And we, we know that today, you know, before these long waiting lists, some 15 to 20% of the patients are unhappy after the joint replacement. And it might well be that the, we don't know very much why, because if we knew that we wouldn't have operated on them. But, but you know, you can have hypotheses and sure. maybe they, they are in better, not in a good shape. So I still say, it, 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 it could never be useless to try. Okay, so it's, it's not it's dangerous. Always, always worth trying, but you won't yes. give a number on them. You won't say, well, 50%, you, you've got end stage arthritis. Um, it's still we, worth trying. 50% um, will get better. You won't put a number on it. No, I, I, we haven't actually, we, we, we don't, because of, of, we don't really know exactly how, when the patient believes that always started. So, so we don't have a question for how long did you have symptoms? We, we feel that it's too unsafe, you know? So I can't say if the, the, the average improvement in our patients, if that is different from those that are, uh, have, um, have a longer uh, analysis of, of, uh, of uh, OA. What we can say is that older patients, which then are more likely to have had osteoarthritis for a longer time, they have uh, the same improvement as the younger patients. Okay, another question here. What is your opinion on offering low laser therapy to give short-term pain relief? So opening a window of relief to mentally start more long-term benefiting mobilization from exercise and movement. So it, it's a question about um, the the offer of low laser therapy in, in helping people. In fact, maybe you could comment on other therapies such as splinting, et cetera, as well as everything else. Yeah, I mean, generally, uh, I think, uh, as I said before, that passive treatment uh, is not the best for the patient. We should activate our patients. And then, uh, of course, we should use um, uh, science, uh, um, what, what has been shown in, in randomized controlled trials. And, and many of those uh, treatments that are used in osteoarthritis are not really based on, on, on evidence. By saying that, I, I could still uh, agree that if a patient is happy with a, with a non-evidenced treatment, I don't think we should take that treatment away, you know, and we can use these kind of treatments even, uh, and I'm saying this even if I consider myself uh, a scientist, you know, we could use this treatment as a try just to get the patient going, but we, we, we should not. Uh, stay with that treatment over a long time period. It should be a, a help for the patient to start uh, come into activation. Okay, okay. and just, just on that theme of end stage osteoarthritis, um, let's take knee and hip again, the commonest one. Maybe I'll ask Christian that. Um, your opinion of the effectiveness of this system in end stage arthritis. So, um, I hate to use the term, but bone on bone, there is an x-ray done, whether you believe it or not. And yeah. somebody has said, I don't think you're going to do that well without surgery. What's your opinion of Joint Academy and the benefit to those patients with end-stage arthritis? Let's take the knee, for instance. Yeah, but it, it has also been, I mean, when you have end-stage osteoarthritis, uh, you need some kind of pain uh, relief. And you also need to keep moving. And it's been shown in studies that exercise can be as good 
uh, pain relief as analgesics uh, or steroids, for example. So uh, actually, I'm, I'm very happy to refer my patients to physiotherapy, treatment, exercise, because I know it's a good pain relief. And I also know that the patients benefit from exercising. When they move, they also keep their heart going, uh, their muscles going, so and they get a better quality of life. So I think that if, if any method to get the patient going, keep moving that joint is good. So and if a digital yeah. treatment is good for them. It's, it's good if they want to go to the uh, traditional physiotherapist, that's good. It doesn't matter for me as long as they do exercise. So they come to you in your rooms. Um, you've got end stage osteoarthritis and a knee with deformity. They do not go on a waiting list. They go to joint school. And are... uh, no, 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 that's not what I said. So of course uh, we do a lot of joint replacements in Sweden and I, I, I put a lot of my patients for surgery, but I think most clinics in, most orthopedic clinics in Sweden, they, uh, they want the patient to try um, exercise treatment first because we had such a good experience with this, what we call osteoarthritis school that started 2008. So we have that as a criteria. Have you not tried uh, the first line treatment with exercise? We think you should wait with the um, uh, uh, surgery. Uh, and uh, some patients, they do two weeks of this exercise and they say that it doesn't work. It's too painful. Of course, they go on the waiting list. But most, most patients are actually quite happy with it. And they do improve a lot. And especially now when I know the waiting li list in Sweden is at least one year for a joint replacement, I'm very happy to refer them to uh, any kind of exercise treatment. Okay. Um, you measure in your app, you do measure and monitor the physical well-being. Do you measure and monitor the mental health and well-being of the patient? Yes, how we do are you use, how do you do we're using EQ5D, uh, very simple. So one of the dimensions there is the mental health uh, question, anxiety. But we, we are not, uh, you know, this is... Um, uh, but, but by using that, we get uh, some kind of knowledge about the mental status uh, of, of the question. That, that could be uh, more deeply uh, examined, but we haven't done that in, in any study yet, although we are uh, uh, well aware uh, about the, the mental status and the mental health and how that relates uh, to a joint uh, problem. So that, that's a good question. Uh, um, but as, as you know, we have to deal with a number of questions that we think are necessary. We have to make a choice of those that we necessarily need to have. So here we have just made a kind of a shortcut so that we get some kind of knowledge about the mental status. Okay. Now, yeah. and finally, uh, this sounds wonderful. For the NHS, the big question, how much does it cost? Who pays for it? Can you give us some idea? on how it's funded in Sweden, Sweden and, uh, and uh, how you hope it might be funded in the UK if it, uh, if it takes off. Certainly. Um, there's a degree of simplicity in Sweden, which is quite helpful. The money follows the patient around and therefore we can promote uh, the service directly to the population. Um, and when we uh, enroll and identify a suitable patient for treatment, and reimbursed by uh, the government effectively There's some simplification there but uh, that's um, in you know sort of broadly the process in the UK we would hope to see our end you know, our end goal hope is that this would be part of a commissioner's musculoskeletal service whether that is an integrated service that is uh, delivered by a prime provider with a range of subcontractors or individual contracts held by a, a commissioner such that we could provide that service to individuals in the community prior to the point at which they were forwarded to a waiting list um, of course in the current climate with waiting lists as they are there's potentially a need for a different conversation with hospital providers and that's something that we're really keen to engage in and I'm personally really keen to engage in I don't have the answers Cormac um, you know let's pick that up 
As far as costing models in um, Sweden, we operate on a per active patient per month model, um, which works because it ensures that there's only a charge where an individual is in the program and actively using the program. So that's quite effective, although that's a contracting model that is challenging within um, an NHS context. But uh, what I would say on that front is we are very much at the beginning of this journey and very much keen to engage with organisations who recognise potential value, um, you know, and to see what we can do in terms of actually getting Jones Academy out in the hands of patients. Okay, thank you very much. We're getting close to the end of the webinar now. I'm just going to invite anybody else on the panel. Does anybody want to ask anybody any questions? I don't see any other questions. I'll just double check. Oh, hang on, here's one. How much emphasis do you put on excess body weight? Does obesity ever change your routine? I think that's another joint academy question. It may be one for David uh, as well. Yeah, that's a, a really good question. And um, in luckily I would say in Sweden, uh, we don't have, um, uh, we, we have obese patients, but not to the dignity I, dignity, I think as in UK and specifically not as in, in the US, uh, um, but my, my general answer is that since most of these um, obese patients, they know uh, their problem and they have been said to, to reduce their weight for a long time period. So, so in, in, when, I, when I saw patients, you know, I usually told them that start with carrying your weight better. That is uh, get muscles that carry your weight uh, instead of uh, trying to reduce your weight it's much easier you have to accept that the more you weigh the the, the strength the stronger you need to have um, your bone muscles so so i think that is much better way around and that is what we are teaching uh, our patients but i can admit you know if you have a bmi of 35 or 40 or 45 or even more you know uh, but but so, so we don't we can't say that we have any good experience or any experience uh, with these kind of patients because they are so rare in sweden so i, I don't think we have uh, caught them into our um, treatment so oh, that's useful to know that we're a fat nation and um, we need to address that. And Dierma, do you have any comments on, yeah, on yeah. patients that you meet and they have pain? And between you and me, you say this guy is overweight um, and he's unfit. How do you approach that situation with a patient? I think um, if I understand correctly, the research on, you know, causation of obesity and, and pain are is sketchy at best and 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 the reasons that pain may be worse in people who are obese are complex and related to all sorts of factors socioeconomic you know poverty poor diet all sorts of factors so they can all contribute to pain experience but it's not as and what we try to steer away from them is this over simplistic kind of body as a machine mechanical problem equals pain message that's really unhelpful generally so we try to unpick it with people for sure people often feel mentally better if they're less heavy um, and they feel more confident and all sorts of factors which will affect their pain so we kind of explore all of that with them I kind of just, just two points in my final messages are I couldn't agree more with Leaf and the messages here around no treatment in isolation and um, unfortunately the UK systems have often been set up to for people to view things as hoops so I must do the exercise first and then I'll be offered surgery that's a really unhelpful you know systems wide thing that needs changing what we want is a, a both and approach so try this exercise who knows some of you may find you decide you don't want to have surgery because you found that's been enough for you rather than a, well I have to do this exercise before I'm allowed to have surgery so that's that's really un, unhelpful and just to come back to the laser thing I'm on the nice guideline for chronic pain which has just been released today and although that's chronic primary pain laser there's a research wreck but there isn't great signal um, for anything there and and again no treatment in isolation sorry I get off my soapbox now well thank you very much I'm just going to wind things up now um, I'm just going to share my screen if I have it here yes I do I'm just going to go into my very last slide so um, just to say thank you, we've had excellent speakers today. I must say I've learned a lot and we need to roll out this information. I feel like, I feel like this, this particular webinar should be repeated and maybe, maybe I might have a chat with Sue about that in the future, adding maybe other speakers in. But I think, uh, I think we've learned a lot today. And 
I look forward to hearing more about Joint Academy. Kyle might personally contact me, maybe, Kyle, and we'll have a chat about that. Um, and um, so thank you, speakers. Thank you for participants. For, thank you for those asking questions. Um, next month is we're into May, and the focus then will be on how technology can help us to deliver at scale in terms of orthopedic surgery. So thank you for that. And with that, I think I will stop sharing. Um, I don't think anybody in the background has anything else to say except many thanks. So I'm going to close the meeting and say thanks to all. Back to work. Thank you very much. Bye.